So we have been walking through the book of 1 Corinthians, going a few chapters at a time. Today we're going to cover chapters 10 and 11. This is week five of this message series. Uh, we record every series, um, every message too. We put them online for free. Go to our website, redhillschurch.com, and you can download all the messages and catch up to this series if you're just jumping in today. But essentially what we've been doing is we've been reading through the book of 1 Corinthians, just a few chapters a week to see what Paul was saying to this church. And he has addressed numerous things over the last five weeks. The first thing he addressed was this idea of celebrity culture, viewing leadership as celebrities and things to be worshipped. He also addressed uh, to this church um, issues of sexual immorality, um, litigation, lawyers, how to view marriage, how to view divorce. He also addressed um, what do we do when we're confronted with this um, idea of eating meat that was sacrificed to idols and using that principle to help us understand issues of spiritual maturity. Um, that was last week and the week before. If you missed out on that, this was a culture um, at this period of time, this is first century, um, where there were a lot of temples for idol worship. And you could find a temple where you could go worship any god you wanted. And in different temples, there were different things that you could worship and different ways that you could worship. And one of the ways you could worship was to go to the temple and bring a sacrifice. And then after the sacrifice is made, sit around with your family and eat. And then the leftovers were sold to the market. So it was a great deal. You could have a celebration of worship and also walk away with some money in your pocket when you sell the leftover food to the market. But these new Christians were confused about how they should handle this situation because they used to worship at these temples and they used to buy their meat at the market. And they don't know if it's okay to buy meat that was involved in an idol worship ceremony and serve it at the dinner table with their homes. So that was one of the questions and one of the things that Paul addressed. And he used that to illustrate the principle that as Christians, we have the power to be able to surrender things that are our rights and our privileges for the sake of loving other people, which is a powerful message. Because in Christ, there is a lot of freedom that you have. As an American, there's a lot of freedom that you have. And Paul would say that as a Christian in America, one of the things that you can do to love people is find ways to surrender the things that are rightfully yours for the sake of someone else. And he used this illustration of meat. And essentially what he said is, it is fine to purchase food at the market that was used in an idol ceremony and serve it to your family. That's not a big deal but you're going to come across people with weak consciences and they came from this culture. And if you come, if they come over to your house and they see you serving this food, they're going to have an issue with it. Not because it's a sin issue, but because it's a conscience issue for them. They're still weak in their faith and they're still growing. How do you handle that? Then don't serve that meat. Surrender your right to eat that meat for the sake of loving your brother who is still weak and doesn't understand that and is going to grow in that area. So that's kind of the stuff that Paul has been talking. And last week he ended with this parable to help us understand the way we're supposed to view our Christian um, walk, which is essentially more like a race. We're supposed to be training and preparing ourselves. And um, uh, in the same way somebody would prepare for running a marathon, um, that's how you're supposed to look at your Christian walk. It is not this series of sprints where you accomplish these things. It is planning for the long term because of what eternity is coming our way. But the beauty in it is that you are not alone. In your preparation for the coming eternity and your walk as a Christian, you are not doing this in and of yourself. You are a part of a community, a large faith community of, of lots of different people who are doing this. And so it should give you comfort in knowing that, well, it's, not, it, it's hard for me to say no to this thing because my, my flesh wants this, but I can say no to it because I've got you know, five or six brothers behind me who are all Christians and we're all saying no to this. It is much easier to obey Christ when you are doing it in the context of community so people can hold you accountable and cheer you on. And that's the idea that Paul left chapter nine with and he starts chapter 10 with. He brings across this idea that you are a part of a big family that has been going on for many generations, which is good news because it keeps you from feeling like this Christian thing is all about you and you're in it for your best interest and your best life. That's not what this is for. You're a part of God's story and his story has been going on long before you were ever born and it's gonna continue long after you are gone. So knowing your part in the story helps your pride. It puts it in the ground. So let's pick up in chapter 10, let's go to verse one. This is Paul addressing the Corinthian church. He says, for I do not want you to be unaware brothers that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized into Moses 
in the cloud and in the sea and all ate the same spiritual food. So he's referencing Exodus and Moses and the children of Israel. And he's telling this church that they are a part of this history of faith. And just like they were baptized into the sea when they passed through, and they were baptized in some way in a cloud when God descended on the mountain. And they all drank and ate spiritual food for they drank from the spiritual rock that flowed from them. That rock was Christ. They were in the wilderness and they had no water. And so Moses spoke to this rock and he hit his staff on the rock and water poured out and they were able to drink from this rock in those same parable style ways. Nevertheless, most of them was not pleased for they were overthrown in the wilderness. So there are these illustrations that we have from Exodus of the people of God being baptized in these different ways and drinking from this rock. And Paul is telling us that those were spiritual shadows and types of the way that we live today. We are baptized in water. We are saved through Christ, who is our rock. All these imageries all throughout time tie us together as a family. You follow? So through this tying together, the problem was that these people, they didn't always respect and obey the things that they were called to, the people of Israel. Now, these things took place as examples for us that we might not not desire evil as they did. Do not be idolaters as some some of them were, as it was written. The people sat down to eat and drank and rose up to play. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did. And 23,000 fell in a single day. He's referencing a specific story that happened to the people of Israel while they were wandering in the desert. We must not put Christ to the test as some of them did and were destroyed by serpents, another reference to a story in um, uh, Numbers, I believe, nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down to us for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. So these things happened and were recorded so that we wouldn't fall into the same trap. Therefore, Let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. See, God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond what your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Now let's pause right there and reflect on what he's saying. Because what he's saying is that we have this long history of being a part of God's family and we have this long history of symbolisms, of baptisms and drinking from the rock and Christ being the rock. And this story unites us because of these symbols, but it also unites us because we have just as much of a need for a savior as the children of Israel did. Israel saw these, mo- these unbelievable, I mean, imagine what it was like to be uh, an Israelite to stand at the, the, the toe of the Red Sea and Moses part it and the sea split and then you walk across on dry ground with a wall of water on either side of you. Imagine what that was like. Imagine waking up every morning and the ground is covered with your breakfast. That your needs are met. Imagine witnessing those miracles and still choosing. I'd rather indulge in my own personal selfishness rather than obey God. You watch the fire of God come down out of heaven and rest on this tent every night and a cloud rest on this tent every morning and that cloud and that fire guide you where you're supposed to be going in the wilderness. It is your GPS. You see this every single day and you still say, yeah, but I'd rather have that. Do not think for one minute because if you were to experience more spiritual experiences in your life, that you would be then more immune to the temptations that fall all of us. We, we can convince ourselves that if just a few things in our life changed, or if we could see some things differently, if I could just watch a miracle, I would believe. I would never struggle with my faith ever again if I could just see a, a real honest to God miracle. We have entire thousands, thousands of stories of people who watched miracles and still struggled in their faith. What makes you think that you're any different? All of us struggle with the same temptation, but the the, the good news is that to all of us is provided a way of escape. So Paul's encouragement in that truth is for us to not be caught up in that same example, but be changed by what we see. 
not see what they saw and then make the same choices they made. View Christ, put him before you, stare at the word of God, listen to the teaching of the message, and let that change you. So use their mistakes as a warning sign so that you can walk a different path. That's what he's trying to encourage them. And also take comfort in knowing that anything that comes your way, you have already been adequately prepared for, and the Lord provides a way of escape through every temptation. At no point are you going to be presented with some temptation and there is no way of escape. You have a promise from the word of God that God has given us a way out. Now this is beautiful because the way that Paul structures this is he brings it as an encouragement, but he also robs you of your excuses. This is good news because God does this, but it's also troubling news because now you have no excuses. You can't say, well, you don't know my background. You don't know the specific circumstances to my issues. You're right, I don't, but he does. And he promises that he provides a way of escape. The fact is that you didn't take it. And that's why you're suffering the repercussions of your choices. So he circles back in verse 14 to the question we addressed last week. And he gives more insight on this issue. Initially, the question was, all right, Paul, can we eat food from the market? It was sacrificed to idols. Can we eat it? And he gives an initial response that essentially says, it's not a big deal. These idols, they're not real gods. And so for the mature in us, it's not a big deal. You can buy it and you can eat it, but you're going to find someone who who are weak. And if you come across them and invite them over for dinner, just don't serve it. Don't sit there and make a case saying, why can't you just grow up? Why can't you just see that this is okay? That's not what we're supposed to be doing. We're supposed to just say, all right, I surrender this. It's not a big deal. We won't make this the point of us gathering for a meal. We'll just share a meal together without that meat. But he circles back to this and addresses one issue that I don't think that they asked, but is important for this uh, situation. Because essentially what they're doing is they're saying, um, Paul, can I get a yes or a no on this? And as a father, he's saying, I can't give you a yes or a no. There's more to it than this. I have to give you the background and the understanding on what's going on in your question before I can give you a yes or a no. So he goes into some depth in verse 14, and he explains this idea a little more. So let's go into it. Verse 14, therefore, my be- beloved. So all those things that we just talked about, therefore, The idea being that the people of God in past history saw amazing things from God and they chose idolatry anyway. My encouragement, verse 14, is for you to flee from idolatry. I speak as to sensible people, judge for yourselves what I say, that the cup of blessing that we bless is not a participation in the blood of Christ. Now he's illustrating and bringing in this idea of communion. So Paul is famous for this, and he's been doing it for 10 chapters. He will say, just like Jesus did, all right, there's a spiritual principle here, and for you to be able to understand it, I'm going to use some some um, temporal things that you see on a regular basis to help you understand big spiritual principles. Communion is the best example of this. It is bread and it is wine, but it symbolizes and communicates something so much bigger, right? It's just food, but, it, but what we're commanded to do with it transforms that into something infinitely much greater, right? So he's borrowing that understanding to help them understand this principle that he's rolling out. So he's going back to this idea of eating food while we're celebrating um, idols. The bread that we break uh, in communion is not a participation in the body of Christ, question mark, he's asking this, Um, but there is one bread. We who are many are one body, for we all partake of one bread. So what he's saying is, in the process of communion, one of the amazing things about it is that it unifies us in a way that we weren't before. You come from this background, you come from this background, you come from this part of the country, you come from this background, this job, blue collar, white collar, there's all kinds of different, different color for skin, backgrounds, you bring all kinds of interesting baggage to church, but one of the things that communion does is it levels the playing field. We're all sinners in need of Christ's sacrifice. So the act of eating and partaking in communion actually levels the playing field and it unites us in some way is what he's saying. Verse 18, consider the people of Israel are not those who eat the sacrifices participants in the altar. So back in the old days when people would come and bring their sacrifices and they participated, weren't they unified in the same way? What do I imply then that food offered to idols is anything or that an idol is anything? No. I imply that what pagans sacrifice, they offer to demons and not to God. 
I do not want you to be participants with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Shall we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he is? So he circles back to answer this question and he answers something that they didn't really ask. They ask, can we eat the food bought in the market? And he brings it back to the actual sacrifice. So essentially what he's saying in chapter nine is that it's okay to eat food that was purchased at a market. But if somebody comes to your home and has a conscience against that, then don't serve it. But I'm going to go even further using the principle of a communion to explain that you cannot, well, it's okay to go to the market and buy the food. It is not okay to go to the idol ceremony and eat that same food. You follow? If it's being sold in the market and it's not being used at that moment for idol worship, it's just food. And those of us who are mature know that. Some of us are weak in that because we came from this culture and we don't want to participate in that. So our conscience, it, it kind of bothers us. So just don't do it. That's fine. But that is a wholly different thing than making decision. You know, we came from idol worship in the temple and some of our aunt, brothers and sisters and, and aunts and uncles, they still do that. Let's just go with them on Saturday. And while they're worshiping idols and making sacrifices, we can eat that food because the food is all the same. He says, no, it's not the same. There is a difference between eating this and participating in that. Because at some level, that act, the moment they're worshiping these idols, what they're actually doing is they're worshiping demonic spirits. They're worshiping false gods. So when you're talking about feeding your family, it's okay, but it is not okay to participate in the worship ceremony of a false god. So let's recap what he says, because this is important for us. It's okay to participate in the systems and the economies of the world. It is okay to use money, dollar bills, to buy things. It's okay to go to a job. It is okay to feed your family off of hard work. If there are some people who are close to you, who are weak in their faith and they stumble with the way that you make your money, for example, because they came from that background. Let's, um, let's say that you, um, uh, you work for an establishment that serves alcohol and this person uh, came from uh, an alcoholic history and they are um, a recovering alcoholic and they have issues with the way that, that, fine, at Thanksgiving, don't bring it up. Just let's have some peace. But there are sections of the world that don't just participate in the economy of the world and don't just make their money off of some job. There are sections of the world who are set up as centers of worship where they actually worship money and they worship alcohol. So while it is okay to participate in some of these areas and that is not idol worship, it is just living your life. There are ways that you can restructure your life that you are not just partaking of things that are harmless to you. You are actually transforming that participation or that hobby into an act of worship. It is not an issue to watch a football game, but it is an issue when you begin to worship that game. Now, what does worship look like? Worship looks like when we turn our affections towards something so that our mood begins to be affected by the thing that we're gazing at. That we are fed in some way emotionally. That there is something that is empty inside of us that can only be filled by this thing. That's when you start dipping your toe into the, the waters of worship, idol worship. So as we recover, what, or as we go back and review what Paul is saying, he's giving us some, some important context. First and foremost is that um, on the one, the one side, the ability to be able to go and buy food at the market, that means we have tremendous freedom in Jesus. We're not under the law. Jesus fulfilled the law on our behalf so that when we stand before God and God says, you broke the law, we say, but Jesus paid my punishment. I'm declared not guilty. And the reason why is because my punishment has already been paid by Christ. And the great judge 
of heaven stands before us and he, he says, it is time for you to give account for all of your deeds and he looks down on your sheet and all that's there are the deeds of Christ. You are now declared not guilty and free from punishment because the punishment has already been paid. That's the beauty of what Christ did on the cross and the burying and the resurrection. But in that freedom... We cannot use our freedom that we have in Christ as an excuse to go back in and participate in the things that once were our shackles. And that's the main idea Paul's trying to get us to understand. There were a group of people who on a regular basis said, I love God and we're his people, but I also love indulging in this. And I love in some sense that it owns me because it gives me those good feelings and I can't stop going back to it. But yeah, you own me, and I'm free, but not really that free. Paul is saying there's no such thing as kind of free. There's either free or not free. So he wraps all this up in this idea that we have to be careful because harmless things, things that, that, that are not idol worship, can very quickly turn into idol worship because it, things have a way of hooking our heart and pulling us in like a fish caught on a lure. And if you're not careful, harmless things, good things can be your downfall. Let's finish in 23. All things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. So let no one seek his own good, but let him seek the good of his neighbor. Eat whatever is sold in the market without raising any questions on the ground of conscience. For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. If one of the believers invites you to dinner and you are disposed to go, go eat whatever is set before you without raising any questions on the ground of conscience. It's not a big deal. Let it go. It's just a meal. But if someone says to you, this has been offered in sacrifice, then do not eat it for the sake of the one who informed you for the sake of conscience. So if they bring it up as an issue, don't argue with them. Let it go. This is the hardest thing for us, right? I could do a 10-week message series on this because we are a people who can't let it go. And I can't let it go because, man, you might see my point of view. Well, let me ask you, how many times has your point of view Core convictions about things ever been changed by reading a Facebook post? Never. Ne never. If it has, please come talk to me afterwards. I would love to meet you. That doesn't happen, but we're convinced it will start with us. That you just haven't heard my point of view. You haven't heard me frame the argument. That's not how things work. And so what Paul is saying is in the context of community, that's where hearts are changed because all of us come on Sunday morning with the assumption that we're going to be smacked in the face with the word of God and we're going to hear some things that we disagree with and something's going to have to change and that something needs to be us. But when you go to Thanksgiving dinner, guess what not everyone showed up with? The assumption that, man, I'm just here to hear some new ways of thinking and I just want to open my mind to what uncle's been talking about all year. Please, please. What new advice have you discovered on Wikipedia? He <laughs> said, so let it go. I do not mean your conscience, but his. For why should my liberty be determined by someone else's conscience? If I partake with thankfulness, why am I denounced because of that for which I am thanks? So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. Give no offense to the Jews or the Greeks or to the church of God, just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, not seeking my own advantage, but that of many that they might be saved. So structure your life in a way that salvation is what you're thinking about and what you care about rather than being right and making your point known. And what we have a hard time understanding is that a lot of times when you make your point and dig your heels in, you are exempting yourself removing the credibility to ever speak on anything to that person on matters of cosmic truth. So be careful what you want to argue about. 
Because if you pick the wrong thing, you're eventually gonna hit the wall where it's time to talk about the right thing and no one wants to hear anything you have to say because they continue to trip over all the other things that you say. So, now we get into some very interesting scripture. So 1 Corinthians 11 has to do with women and hair length and head coverings. Let's do it. We're gonna go to 12, we're just gonna skip it. No, I'm kidding. Because <laughs> that's not what we do. Um, I'll, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna read uh, chapter 11, verses two through 16. If this is your first time here, like, man, buckle up. What a, what a Sunday to show up for your first time. Um, I'm gonna read through it, and then I'm gonna give some context for the way that he's speaking and what he's talking about. Um, but it's important for us to understand that Paul has a way of speaking. And if I were just going to crack open my Bible and read chapter 11, verses two through 16, and walk away with the assumption that the only thing he's talking about is the length of your hair and whether you can wear a hat in church and call it a day, I think we would be doing the entire book of 1 Corinthians a disservice. And remember, this is not a book. It was not originally written like that. It was written as a letter. Paul has a way of writing and a continuation of thoughts. And one of the things that he's been doing is using um, things within our culture to help us understand bigger, stronger spiritual principles. And I think that's what he's doing here. So when we read this, if at the end you think, amen, women should not have short hair. I'm probably not going to change your mind this morning. But what I would like to do is I'd like to show you from a biblical perspective what I think Paul is trying to address and personally where I stand on this issue and why I think he's trying to use these illustrations to explain this spiritual principle. You ready? This is good. Let's go. Chapter 11, verse 1. Be imitators of, of me as I am of Christ. Now, I commend you because you remember me in everything... So you guys are doing a good job, props to you for remembering me and everything and maintaining the traditions even as I delivered them to you. Okay, that's important to understand what's coming next. Paul has just said that they are doing a good job in some things and whatever the traditions are that he taught them, they're following them. However, he brings a little bit of correction. But I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ. So, there is an authority structure that Paul is about to roll out. The head of a wife is her husband. So, in the home, there is an authority structure where the, the husband is the head of the home. That does not mean he is a Neanderthal who walks around dragging his knuckles and reminds the woman on a regular basis, I am in charge and you need to cook me dinner. What that is more in line with is um, think about a pharmacist, okay? Uh, you go to Walgreens and you get your prescription prescription and you go home and you open up the bottle and you realize they gave you the wrong prescription. You took it and it made you sick. Who are you going to sue? The pharmacy technician that filled your bottle or the pharmacist who was on call that day or the organization responsible? There are, in our understanding, in our mind, authority structures for who is accountable for certain things. And that's one of the responsibilities of people in the higher levels of leadership. They are responsible for everyone underneath them, the good and the bad. And when Paul says there is an authority structure in the home, and it starts from Christ to the husband, and the husband is over his wife, he's not reminding them that you are in charge and what you say goes. What he's saying is that when you stand before God, you are accountable for every single thing that happens in your home, whether you did it or not. Now, who wants that? Suddenly, that turns from uh, yeah, I can get in line with being, a, oh, that's what it means. <laughs> so he's setting up this authority structure. Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his own head. But every wife who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head since it is the same as if her head were shaven. Now, he's introducing some common uh, vernacular for them. There are some ways of thinking in their culture that when you see someone with long hair, it's a girl. Because in this culture, guys don't have long hair. And if a girl has her head shaved, that is a shame to her because she is replacing her God-given uh, role as a female. And the way that people view that 
with uh, uh, swapping that out with the role of a male. So what he's saying is that when you guys come into worship services, that authority structure that God has set up, you are responsible for honoring that when you gather. God made man and woman. He did not make some men who think they're women and some women who should have been men. He made men and he made women. And when you gather for worship, you should honor that structure that God saw fit to choose, not we saw fit to change. And there are ways in the culture to reinforce that that way that God has organized the structure. And in this culture, it had to do with hair and covering your head. So when you gather, this is interesting, men are praying and prophesying, which prophecy is essentially speaking out what God has brought to mind. So proclaiming truth that God has spoken to you. But women are doing this too. Women are doing this in the church saying they are praying and they are prophesying publicly. So for if a wife, verse six, will not cover her head, will not show the form of um, structure and authority that she has been um, uh, born into and that God established, then she should cut her hair short. She should go ahead and just publicly profess in a physical outward way that I don't want anything to do with the way that God has ordered structure. I want to do my own thing and let everybody know where she stands on that. But since it's disgraceful for a wife to cut her hair or shave her head, let her cover her head. For a man ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and the glory of God, but woman is the glory of man. What is he talking about? He's talking about the way that creation came about. He's not saying that women are inferior. He's talking about the divine order that God saw fit to create. He created man, and then he created woman from man. There is an order. There is one that came first and one that came second. One does not mean they are more valuable than the other. It just simply means that this is the structure they were created, and therefore this is the order of authority we should follow. So if something is falling apart in the home, guess who's not to blame? The wife, which is tough to hear. Because in some of the homes, the problem is a contentious wife. But in the eyes of God, a contentious wife is the issue that a husband has to deal with before God because he's the head of his home. Look, it's not fair. And it's probably not what you would choose but can you at least afford that you don't have the wisdom that God has and he may have had some information that you don't have and this is the reason why he set it up this way. And that we have a responsibility to either decide to follow whatever the culture is telling us or we follow whatever the Bible is telling us. And it can be as simple as that. For man was not made for woman, but woman for man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. He's talking about Genesis. He's talking about the structure and the order. It's not that woman was created and then God looked down and said, I want a companion for him. It's uh, man was created, I want a companion for uh, him. So I'm going to create woman. That is why a wife ought to be a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. Now that's weird. And the only thing that I can glean from reading through commentary and the context is that Paul has referenced in other places that someday we are going to um, be uh, ruling and judging over angels. In the next kingdom, things are coming our way that are different than here. And there are other created beings who are in some ways lesser than us because we have the spirit of God on the inside of us. We are the pinnacle of God's creation because he put himself in us when he created us. And so when these angels, these messengers, these people who view the way that we live our lives, when they view us and they show up on our worship services, and yes, worship services are entered or or, are um, um, uh, viewed from the spiritual perspective. There are angels in this room, probably right now that you cannot see who are viewing the teaching of the word of God, who are viewing your worship, who are participating in it. And when they view us, they should be seeing the same authority structure that God saw fit to set up. So nevertheless, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man, nor man of woman. Now, this is what's interesting. Because in the authority structure, where the man is accountable to God for his family, God has also made that man dependent on women, because there's no men out here having babies. And that's what he says. For as woman was made from man, so woman was created from the rib of man. Now man is born of woman. So man, you're not coming out of this. You're not showing up in the world without a woman. 
And women, you're not having more children without men. There is a dependence that is created in the economy of God. There is an authority structure for who is responsible for things. And then there is a dependence within the family of God so that each needs the other. You cannot be complete without your spouse. So, all things are from God. Judge for yourselves. Is it proper for a wife to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not nature itself teach that if a man wears long hair is a disgrace for him? Is it not obvious in your culture that when a man wears his hair long, everyone thinks it's a lady? Because culturally, where you live, that is what most people view as the differentiation between man and woman, hair length. Things are much different for our culture. But there's still a principle that is important for us to follow. For her hair is given to her for a covering. If anyone is inclined to be contentious, we have no such practice, nor do the churches of God. So Paul, at the very beginning in in chapter two, he teaches this tradition, or he references a tradition that he taught to this church. And it seems to be that this church was taking this tradition and using it incorrectly. So they had knowledge and their application was incorrect. It seems to be that this tradition had to do with gender roles in their culture, things that clearly defined what was a man and what was a woman. To understand this text, I think we need to use the same um, uh, structure and culture, or not culture, the same structure that Paul has built through the last 10 chapters, where he essentially says, I'm going to use these things like hair length that you guys all understand to explain bigger biblical principles about the structure of the way that the home should work and how worship services should be using. I don't personally think that this is a command from Paul that all men should have short hair and all women should have long hair and guys can't wear hats in church. I don't think that's what he's addressing here. And if that's what you think, that's fine. I'm not gonna argue with you. But I would like you to hear my perspective because I think that if you see it from this perspective, this is a lot deeper than just how long your hair is. And what I mean by that is that what I think he's trying to get across is that there is a mutual understanding in our culture where you live that there are certain things that define what is a man and what is a female. And we as Christians should not violate those things in the name of our freedom in Christ. You follow? In this culture, hair length was one of those things. And so he's using that to explain how they're not supposed to take this tradition that he taught them to use it to exercise their freedom in a different way, which comes right off of the heels of chapter 10, where he's using the same argument. Don't use your freedoms and exercise the things that are rightfully yours when people who you love are stumbling over it. Now, what is the tradition that he's referencing here? I've looked up lots of different commentaries and lots of scholars, and most people point to Paul's teaching in Galatians chapter three, verses 23 through 29. So let me read that to you. Paul says in Galatians three, now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian for in Christ, you are all sons of God through faith. So now that Christ has come, things are a little bit different. For as many of you were baptized into Christ and have put on Christ, now neither is there Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you all alone are in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offering, offspring, heirs according to the promise. So what he's essentially saying here in Galatians is that under Christ, there is a new way for us to be unified. And that men and women and children and adults and slave and free and Jew and Greek are all equally free and equally valued. That does not erase the authority structure that God had set up back in Genesis, but it does reaffirm the value system of how we're supposed to treat one another. Not everybody is a manager. Thank God. Not everybody is the president. Thank God. The president, managers, people in high levels of leadership, fathers, husbands, you carry a tremendous burden for your family. It is a burden that will not rest on the shoulders of your wife. 
It is a burden that should never rest on the shoulders of your children. But that does not mean that you are more valuable and more worthy than your wife or your children. Basically, Christ has unified all of us and there we are in some ways equal, but what this church did was they used this message to empower themselves to throw off those social norms. And so what happened was women were starting to come to church and doing things that were contrary to the social norm of the day, which was cover your hair when you show up as a symbol of the authority that you were a part of in the family of God. They're saying, well, Paul taught us this new tradition where we're all the same now, so I'm just gonna let my hair down. Here's the problem. They lived in a city where prostitutes let their hair down. So here's what you have. You have a church full of new believers, and some of them are exercising their freedom to do things like let their hair down, but their exercising of freedom looks a lot like the culture of sin they came from. So the out, the, the outside world watching this church is saying, it looks to me like some of you are saying no to this stuff, but some of you are saying yes to this stuff. And it's clouding and confusing the teaching of the word of God and how you're supposed to understand walking a holy life. So here's what Paul's advice is. If it comes down to in your culture where people are confused about what authority looks like because of you exercising some of your God-given freedoms, then surrender those freedoms and keep covering your hair. I do not think that this is an order or a command from the Bible for us to start growing your hair long if you're a girl and you can't grow it long if you're a guy. I don't think that that's important because in our culture, that's not something that is, let me give you an example if I was gonna contextualize it. Um, There are general norms Uh, in our country still, it won't be like this for long, but there are norms in our country where there is an expectation of a pastor that he will not show up on Sunday in a skirt. When When I come here on Sunday morning, you are expecting that I will not be wearing a dress. Maybe you've never thought of that, and maybe now you can't get that out of your head. My apologies, the point is, There are expectations from nature, from culture, that you just assume that you're not going to see when you come here on Sunday. But if I were to go over to Scotland and showed up on Sunday morning in a kilt, which is essentially a skirt, not one single person would think anything of it. Because there are cultural norms in wherever we live that help us differentiate something as simple as that's a man and that's a woman. And as Christians... What Paul is saying is that, yes, we are free, but we can't use that freedom to confuse people about something as simple and as basic as there's a man and a woman. Now, this might seem unnecessary for us now for me to spend this time, but here's the truth. We are on the heels of one of the greatest culture wars that this country has ever seen because what is being attacked now is the identification of something as simple as a man and a woman. And I promise you, it is not going to stop there. We will be having conversations in the near future about whether we should change our laws to allow a 40-year-old man to marry an 11-year-old girl. It's coming, I promise. Because when we start making arguments like actual biological science It's not right. It's about what I feel. I don't feel this way, so I should change the way that I look or who I am. Whatever I am, God got it wrong, and it's up to me to change it. I promise the conversations we're having now will not stop. They will only continue. And if we don't have a reference point biblically for how we're supposed to view something as basic as God created man and woman in his own image, We're going to have a tough time navigating the waters headed our way. So let's finish today by reading the rest of uh, 11, 17. He gets into the Lord's Supper. We're going to end here. But in the following instructions, I do not commend you because you come together. It's not for the better, but for the worse. For in that place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you. And I believe in it in part, for there must be factions among you in order that you are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry and another gets drunk. 
So they're coming together to take communion, but they're ending with people getting drunk. What? It's my favorite way of reading that. <laughs> do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you with this? No, I will not. For I received from the Lord that I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he gave it, he gave thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So Jesus gave us a, a very simple instructions. He took bread and wine, he broke it, and he gave it. That's it. Hard stop. In the same way, he also took the cup after the supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or the cup or the drink, drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself, examine his own heart, whether he is full of sin, before he goes and eats the bread and drinks the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some of you have even died. What? You mean you can die from taking communion? Yeah. That's what Paul says. That's as wild as it gets, folks. But if we judge ourselves truly, we, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that when we may not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let them eat at home. So when you come together, it will not be for judgment about the other things I would give directions when I come. So what's happening? Paul is addressing another issue within this church. They were taught communion, but they were treating it like golden corral. You're supposed to come together with wine and bread, and all of a sudden it's turned into an all-you-can-eat smorgasbord. And no one knows when to say no, and everyone's getting drunk, and people who don't have food to bring don't get eaten. Uh, don't, don't get eaten. They don't get to eat. <laughs> Poor choice of words. They don't get to eat. And so some people are getting left out. And you're calling all of this communion. That's not communion. And this is the reason why some of you are getting sick and dying. And that, that's kind of crazy because it, it begs the question, can you actually suffer physically for dishonoring the Lord? The answer is yes. It happens here. It happened in Acts chapter 5. Look, we may be blind to sin, but God takes sin very seriously. And when he gives us a command on how we're supposed to view things like communion, we better do it right. Amen? All right, so the purpose of these chapters are to remind us of a couple things. First and foremost, God has an order and a beauty to his family, and it's our responsibility to reflect that beauty and order and not detract from it. Okay? He's also teaching that the sacraments like communion and baptism, they should be treated with the reverence they deserve, not like rituals we have to perform and not modify them in ways that are more comfortable for us. And the last thing he's driving home is that God takes sin very, very seriously. Division in the church, he does not blink at it. You do not want to catch the wrong end of that stick. Trust me, if you treat sin like it's not a big deal, you will be reaping the consequences of that poor decision. But if you view sin and disobedience the way God does, and it breaks your heart, not just because you're caught, but because in God's eyes, you've been exposed and you broke the relationship with him, you can be spared a great amount of judgment and sadness in your life. Amen? Let's close with that. Mm -hmm.